Hello and welcome to this exercise in which we fit a polynomial regression model to data in RStudio. These data derived from a study by Jones and colleagues in the British Medical Journal and their work was concerned with decayed, missing and filled teeth in children and how that might relate to the fluoride concentration in the water that the children were drinking. They looked at 21 populations of children and they had an index, it's the decayed, missing or filled teeth per 100 children uh, against the fluoride uh, concentration in water in terms of parts per million. I've read these data in and now we need to go and fit a variety of models to work out the most appropriate predictive model. So the first thing we should be doing is, of course, plotting our relationships. So this is just what we're going to be doing here. Uh, in terms of fitting a model, first of all, we need a Y response variable, and that is the uh, decayed and missing teeth uh, index. Here we need also a predictor variable, and that's the uh, fluoride concentration in parts per million. Now, to do this analysis uh, in terms of fitting more and more complicated models, it will help to actually define x squared and x cubed. And since we've defined x in this way, I'm simply going to define x squared in that way uh, too. It's, uh, it's the square of x. The cube of x is, of course, x raised to the power 3. So all individual x observations are now cubed, and we've created another vector for x cubed. And just to be on the safe side, we're going to be looking at x to the power 4. Now let's simply plot a graph of the relationship between x and y. So this is what we do here, and we find that there is uh, apparently a relationship between this DMF index and the fluoride concentration and it appears uh, somewhat non-linear uh, overall. Now to begin with we'll fit a linear model to these data. How do we go about doing that? Well we can call up the GLM routine for simply putting a relationship between Y and X. We can then examine whether x explains variability in y by uh, uh, asking for the analysis of variance breakdown. And here what we can see is that the x value explains significant variability in y, in that the probability of us getting that test statistic or more extreme, if the null hypothesis of there being no relationship, uh, is actually really, really very small, so we reject the null hypothesis. Now, we can fit that model that we have actually uh, calculated and estimated back onto the graph by simply using the abline command here. And this is what I'm doing here and we'll see that uh, the uh, fitted model now appears on the graph. So this is what we've done here. Now you will note that there is some curvature in that relationship so perhaps a higher order model uh, would be a better predictive model. We can fit a higher order model by simply saying, for example, in this case, fit2 is the linear model of y and how it's related to x and x squared. And likewise, we can look at the analysis of variance breakdown of this model. And this is what we get uh, here. So, with a type 1 sum of squares, we know that x explains significant variability in y. But here, the x squared term explains significant variability above and beyond that explained by x. This is the beauty and value of a type 1 sum of squares, a sequential sum of squares, in that as we are building our model of increasing complexity, we are asking at each case whether that additional complexity is justified in terms of explaining additional variability in the model over and above the simpler model. So, uh, let's now fit this model to uh, the uh, graph and see how that actually looks. 
to do so, what we need is uh, to define a variable uh, xv, which is x values, and I'm going to go from the minimum value of x that was observed to the maximum and uh, take it in small steps of 0 0.01. What is the yv? Well, the y comes from the predicted uh, fit of the model, and uh, here is how we will specify that. The yv is predict from fit 2, because fit 2 is the fit of the linear model, and one of its uh, properties uh, is that we can now predict uh, based on that fitted model and the coefficients that have been estimated. And uh, here we are putting x as xv and the x squared term that we have fitted as xv squared. And now we can simply draw those lines on and I'm drawing them in green and we will see here uh, that uh, we have explained some of that curvature in our data. We've got this nice fit of a quadratic well, we might think, well, what about an x cubed term? Uh, could we fit a more complicated model? Well, of course, we could have a go. And uh, here is the fit of the more complicated model. So this has x, x squared, and x cubed. You will note that uh, we've not gone for just a model of x and x cubed, say, that we have respected the hierarchy in that we have, by including x cubed, we are also necessarily including a model with x squared and x in as well. So there's the fit 3, there's the analysis of variance for the fit of that model 3. x explains significant variability in y, x squared explains significant variability in y once you take into account the variability explained by x itself. But x cubed fails to explain significant variability over and above that explained by x and x squared. So we're left with a view overall that the quadratic, the model with x and x squared is superior because adding that extra term does not explain significant variability uh, in the model. Now let's ha have a look at the fitted model of the x cubed term. Uh, here again I'm defining xv. I didn't really need to redefine it that way because it's defined above. Uh, yv is now the prediction uh, from the, the fit of that third level, the cubic model, and of course x, x squared and x cubed from that uh, third model come now from the x values that we are exploring and we want to join them and uh, i have actually drawing them uh, there in black. Well we can see that of course uh, because it's a cubic model we do have curvature but I hope you can see that the fit of the cubic model and the fit of the uh, squared model seem really very very similar and uh, Part of the similarity arises from the fact that that cubic term really doesn't explain uh, much of the additional variance above and beyond that uh, explained by uh, x and x squared. So we're left with just one more thing now, and that is just to establish whether the underlying assumptions of the fit of our general linear model are appropriate. Since we've gone for the quadratic model, I'm just going to choose the quadratic model in this case. And the first thing is uh, I'm going to be looking at the residuals. And uh, the residuals look uh, pretty dandy to me in terms of uh, there being no overall strong pattern. If we had fitted the linear model, we might have seen some pattern in those residuals because, in effect, we're fitting the wrong model to the data since there was clearly curvature there. And uh, here we can, of course, examine the normality and overall the distribution of the residuals appears relatively normal.